stand together and we'll pray. We thank you now, Lord, for your word that it will outlive the heavens and the earth, that it will always be yea and amen. We thank you for the privilege of being able to turn to it tonight. Would you speak to us the way that only you can, Lord, as our Father and through your Spirit, giving it life and application to each one of our lives and our calling, Lord, as Christians and as your ambassadors in this world and then, Lord, in the uniqueness and the personal calling of your Holy Spirit upon each one of our lives, the unique place that you have called us and desire to equip us for on planet Earth for your glory. Open your word up to us, we ask, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul uh, established the church uh, in Corinth on his second missionary journey. And all of that is recorded in Acts chapter 18. It was a very, uh, it was a good sized city. Um, it wasn't as great as Modesto, but we have to stay modest, don't we? But it was, it was bigger than Modesto, size of about a half a million, 500,000, and um, very strategic, very famous city of the ancient world. It was a center for business and commerce in the ancient world because it was located on a very ne narrow neck of land known as an isthmus between uh, the northern portion of what is modern-day Greece. It was known in ancient times as Macedonia. And then the southern portion of Greece, it's all Greece today, but then it was Achaia. And so uh, these two uh, areas, both of them very prosperous in Greece, connected by this narrow band of land. And uh, because that the little band of land was so uh, narrow, it was profitable for those that were in shipping to um, rather than go all the way down to the south of Greece in difficult weather to come in and uh, dock there and uh, even put the ships on rollers, run it across land from the Adriatic Sea and then launch it into the Ionian Sea. And so it was on this uh, uh, all travel going east and west from Rome to Asia was passing through Corinth. And so it was a city that was fabulously wealthy. It was known like the United States of America. It was a, it was a place that was sports crazy. And um, I'm not, that's not a criticism, by the way. And um, so uh, they had in Corinth... Next to the Olympics, the most famous games of the ancient world were there. It was famous for its architecture. You've, uh, some of you have perhaps heard of Corinthian columns and famous for their art and all of these things. But the two things that made Corinth famous in the ancient world and, and perhaps infamous is, is the phrase for it, is it was known for drunkenness and known for sexual immorality. Uh, the temple to Aphrodite was located. And, of course, anytime you've got sailors in the ancient world going east and west and, and two, really two cultures, and we know today about east and western cultures uh, kind of clashing together there, Corinth became a place where there were just temples to every god imaginable, you know, were, were there. But the temple to Aphrodite was there, and associated with the worship of Aphrodite were 10,000 prostitutes, male and female alike, who would go out all through the day and the night and uh, uh, providing their whatevers to uh, those that were in Corinth and those that were passing through. So it was known as a, it was a Las Vegas of, of, um, of the ancient world. Also known for drunkenness when they would portray a Corinthian on the ancient stage, they would always portray him drunk. 
And so uh, to uh, speak of someone, if you, were to, if you wanted to slander someone, you'd say, oh, he's just a Corinthian, even if he wasn't a Corinthian, and it would mean he was just a drunkard and a sexually immoral people. But even in the midst of uh, that kind of, you know, it's one thing to have a reputation for that. It's another thing to live in the city where that is the reality every single day, how debauched uh, the city was. And yet in the midst of that, God chose to plant a church in w- one of the most significant churches uh, in, the, uh, in the early church there through the Apostle Paul. And so he went there and he preached the gospel there and a church was planted. But some problems began to develop. And Paul, by the time he writes this letter from Ephesus on his third missionary journey, so some time has gone by since he's left that church. He spent a year and a half in Corinth establishing that church. And then later on in his third missionary journey from Ephesus, he gets word that there's some real serious problems in the church at Corinth. And so he writes to address those problems. Now, uh, a lot of times people will say, you know, we've got to get back to being like the early church. Trust me, we are like the early church. Almost all of the epistles were written that were written were corrective epistles. They were correcting either false doctrine or or unholy living or unholy thinking or whatever it might be. And God is able to work all things together for good. So even though they were a mess, the upside is, is that they were such a mess that God wrote a letter to them by the Holy Spirit to address all, so, all of these problems that they had. And it is a part of our word here that we get to read and learn what God has to say about these same messes, all of which we are prone uh, to find ourselves in also. So it wasn't a, per, a, a perfect church, uh, but then, um, except for here. <laughs> So he begins with a greeting in verse 1. And when you began a letter in the ancient world, your greeting always was made up of four things. You would identify yourself, first of all, as the writer of the letter. And then you would identify who you were writing it to. Then the third thing you would do is you would actually greet the people that you were writing to. And then you would attempt to, if it was possible, say something favorable to them. uh, Some uh, note of thanksgiving. I'm thankful for this and I'm thankful for that and all. And so Paul uh, follows follows that ancient model here. And he begins by identifying himself in verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. He wasn't self-appointed. As an apostle, uh, if God hadn't saved him and called him, he would have been a religious maniac all the days of his life and right on into the eternal lake of fire. But God did save him, knocked him off his high horse on that, on that road to Damascus, and not only saved him, but as is the case with all of us, God had a call on his life, and the particular call that God had on Paul's wife was that he would be an apostle. So he identifies himself as an apostle, because he's going to be corrective to them. So he comes in his office and he expresses the authority that he has called, not by man nor by himself, but called by Jesus himself, the authority that he has to speak to them and for them to take seriously what it is that he has to say. So an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, now, that's an interesting name, Sosthenes. I haven't dedicated a Sosthenes uh, yet on a Sunday morning. But it's a beautiful name. It's a beautiful story. We read about Sosthenes in Acts chapter 18 when Paul went to and established the church uh, there in Corinth. Um, things were, uh, he went and he preached the, the gospel in the synagogue and then ultimately, you know, he said, you know, your blood be on yourself. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And he moved to a, a, a room that was uh, adjoining the synagogue, began to teach the word of God there and all. And uh, at some point began to fear for his physical safety. The, the, the fruit was so good in the city. But the religious Jews were so upset with him, and he knew, having been one himself, the danger that you can be in when the religious Jews are upset with you. And so uh, God spoke to him and said, listen, uh, don't be afraid. I'm going to protect you. I've got a lot of people in this city. A lot of people in Corinth? Yeah, I've got a lot of people in, in this city. Cities like this, they get sick of their sin. 
and uh, bearing the consequences of it. And so you keep preaching the gospel here, and I'll take care of things. Well, the next kind of step in things is that the Jews, including Sosthenes, who was the ruler of the synagogue there in that place, he takes and brings Paul before the Roman officials and judges there in Corinth, and they begin to make false accusations against Paul and everything. And <clears throat> Galileo, who is uh, over the, the Roman governor, who is over that area, he listens to the charges, says they're nonsense, and he says, get out of here. And before they can all get out of there, the, the accusers of, of Paul, uh, some of the Roman soldiers apparently come in and they begin to beat Sosthenes and these people that, and, and his cohorts that have been, uh, you know, uh, accusing. Paul. So interesting here he is, the ruler of the synagogue at that time. We don't know what happens, you know, to him or anything like that. We lose sight of him in the narrative. And then the next thing, Paul's introducing him as a brother. (laughs) You ever had someone just hate your guts when you became a Christian? I mean, just hated you? Do anything? They shut that guy up. And then it's funny how over a period of years, all of a sudden, God will break through in their life. And the next thing you've got is one of the most precious relationships in all of your life. And how many of, of the, the relationships that are most important to us in life, so often, not always, but so often, they're birthed out of a very difficult chapter earlier in life. But God changes everybody that's involved and brings a happy ending to it. And that's uh, what appears to have happened there in Corinth. Now, this is who he's writing to in verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, that word church in the original language, I would just like to let you know that I know a little bit about the original language. Very little about the original. But that word church is an important one to know, because in the original language, it's ecclesia. And and what it means is the called out ones. The church is not this building. You are the church as Christians. The church is a living thing. It's a living organism. The church is what is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, whether it's Christians in India or in Thailand or in Peru or in Keys, just talking about remote kind of cultures and things, or wherever it might be for us. Wherever God's people are, we are the church. So technically, if someone were to call into the office and reach the secretaries and say, hey, where's the church located? They would say, having the slightest idea. Some of them are probably teaching at the local high schools today, and some of them are on the construction sites, and some of them are probably working at the mall. We are the church. That's how God sees things. People that have been born again by the Holy Spirit. So the church of God, and that's who the church belongs to. They're struggling with that a little bit. He's going to he's going to get to them on it to the church of God, which is at Corinth. The church is everywhere. But he's he's speaking now specifically to those that are Corinth, but then also to those who are sanctified. And and that's in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Now, the word sanctified and saints that the word that's used for both of them, it's a variation of the same word. They're pretty close. It's hagios, and, and it's the word holy. And, and the word hagios, and it would be the word that would be ascribed to an instrument that would be used in the worship of God in the Old Testament uh, temple or tabernacle. And so anything that's described as hagios as sanctified, is something that is, in God's eyes, has been set aside for the exclusive use of God. And that's how God sees us as Christians. Now, that's, how, that's, that's what we are in Christ. They were living far below holiness. But that's what we are. Our lives are now an instrument in God's hands to be used supremely and exclusively for His Purposes in the world with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So Paul is saying to them, don't forget that you share uh, the Lord, you share the Lord Jesus, 
with the rest of the body of Christ all over the world. They were a little uh, elevated in their opinions of themselves. And so he's before he even gets to their problems, he's laying a foundation for things. Then he greets them in verse three. Grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To say to someone the Gentile greeting in that day, a Gentile would, or, or Greek would greet another Greek by saying charis, or they would say uh, grace, unmerited favor, undeserved favor be upon your life. The Jews would uh, never greet one another with, with a Gentile greeting. They would greet one another by saying shalom to one another, peace. May the peace of, of God be upon your life. And what Paul does here in writing these letters, and it characterizes all of his letters, when he greets, is he takes the Gentile greeting and the, and the Jewish greeting, and he couples them together and to make the most complete greeting you can give to anyone, grace and peace be to you. Now, it's always in that order in the New Testament. Grace first, and then peace. Because no one, not even a Christian, no Christian, can ever know the peace of God until they know the grace of God. Until I'm strong in the fact, the realization that God does not deal with me on the basis of my works or what I deserve, but he deals with me every day on the basis of grace. He's not making a list, checking it twice. That's somebody else. That's not God. Now, many of you in this room, you sit and you say, all right, he's given us the grace and peace bit. Hold on a second while I pull your ear a second. The reason that it's always in that order, grace and peace, is because that's always the order for life. I can only know the peace of God tonight as I'm strong in the fact that he deals with me on the basis of grace. And it's one thing to know that in my mind, and it's another thing to know it about my circumstance tonight, the situation that I'm facing tonight. And for some of us, we may, we may lose you for five minutes in the course of the study. That's why we take things. But you may just need to settle there right now as it relates to the doctor's report that you've got or the stack of bills that you've got or what somebody's saying about you or whatever the situation might be. And, or, or, and it's very easy for us as Christians... We know we can know so much. We can walk with the Lord for a long time and then it slips back in. God blesses me because I do these things. God blesses me because I am these things. And now it's no longer grace. And what is the casualty of it? Peace. I don't have peace tonight that he's going to take care of me. But then when I realize, no, it's always been grace. He's never going to give me what I deserve here. He's got the grace for me. He knew what he was getting when he saved me. And so he's got the grace. He promises to deal with me on the basis of grace. And all of a sudden, I have peace in my life. I don't have a works-oriented relationship with God. It's a grace-oriented relationship with God. And we'll leave it there because we could go on for another hour about all of that. And then he gets into his thanksgiving. In verse 4, he said, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you by Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge. Now, Paul is uh, he's beautiful. There's not a, he's not a phony bone in his body. And, and he's kind of following Jesus' model. You remember in the book of Revelation where Jesus writes the seven letters to the seven churches, to every single one of those churches, he tried, before he ever got to correction, where correction was needed, he always tried to say something good about them. There were two churches, there was nothing he could say good about them, and so he, he drew a rather large blank. When God can't find something good, you know, it's a little rough. But, but that's his model, was uh, Jesus' model. You know, in... In virtually any church or in any person, there's something to be thankful for in their life. And, and so to make mention of that before he's going to get to the correction, he's, he's being like the Lord in that. Now, Paul's got a problem here because he really doesn't have much where he looks at their lives or he looks at their church and can say, 
I'm really thankful for you because you're doing this and because of this and you're a holy people and you're changing the world around you and all that kind of stuff. He can't say any of that. There's nothing to be thankful for because they're not any of those things. So what does he do? He, he says, well, I can thank God <laughs> for saving them and then blessing them with spiritual gifts. And the church at Corinth as he talks about there in verse 5, that they were enriched in everything and all utterance and in all knowledge. He's going to talk in verse 7, so that you come short in no gift, speaking of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church at Corinth had all of the spiritual gifts in operation. They had uh, all of the utterance gifts, uh, the gift of tongues. They had the gift of, of uh, interpretation of tongues. They had all of the knowledge gifts, prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. All the different gifts of the Holy Spirit were in operation there in the church at uh, Corinth. And so Paul is able to say to God, uh, concerning God, I thank God that he's given you all those gifts. He's going to spend chapters 12, 13, and 14 informing them that they're using them all wrong for their purposes but he, he waits a little while before he gets to that. So he's thankful that they have all of the gifts. I think it's important for us, and, and not that you uh, look at another church or whatever and say, you know, because there are churches that believe in all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit being in operation today. And they don't say, well, these went out in the first century or when the apostles died. And then you have others that, that believe that. We happen to believe that, and we'll, we'll talk about it when we get into uh, chapter 13, but we believe that all of the gifts are in operation today. I'll show you biblically why later. But, then, uh, uh, but that they're to be used in the way that God wants them uh, to be used. But the fact that I have a spiritual gift in my life is, only means that God is gracious. It doesn't mean that I'm spiritual. A person is spiritual when they obey God's word and they live a life like Christ. And it's very easy for us as Christians to think, well, you know, God gives me word of wisdom or God gives me word of knowledge or God exercises the gift of prophecy through me. And so this becomes the, 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 um, the, the way in which I determine whether I'm right with God or not or I'm a spiritual person or not. They had all of the gifts operating in that church and it was a madhouse. <laughs> They're very far from being a holy church at all. And, and, and the gifts were being uh, abused. That doesn't mean that a charismatic or a Pentecostal church is um, unspiritual because they believe in all of the gifts and that kind of thing. I'm talking about us individually and personally. It is never an indication necessarily of spirituality. And so he said, even as, verse 6, the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So Paul is saying that when the gospel, the testimony... Concerning Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection and salvation being found in that gospel, God confirmed uh, that testimony when they gave their lives to the Lord. God gave them spiritual gifts and, and it was uh, as, a, as a testimony uh, or, or confirming uh, their faith in the Lord Jesus. And then he said, um, who, speaking of the Lord, will also confirm you to the end. He'll make you secure to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he praises the Lord for giving them. He's thankful for the fact that God has given them spiritual gifts. And then he says, all right, and I'm thankful that God is, has been faithful to you and he will be faithful to you. And, and, and it's, a, it's a very carnal church, dominated by the flesh. But he still speaks to them and says, listen, what God has begun, even in carnal people, he'll bring to completion. And he's going to make you secure all the way into heaven's glory. And he's going to make you blameless because of Christ on that day that we go to be with the Lord. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. They were not trustworthy. They were not faithful. But God was faithful. Faithful. I am very, very glad, I, and I don't use it as an occasion to sin or to be sloppy in, in my obedience to the Lord, but I'm glad that the fact that one day I'm going to stand in heaven is based upon His faithfulness and not upon 
my faithfulness. Now in verse 10, he addresses the first problem uh, there in uh, Corinth. And he said, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division uh, divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So he comes to them and he pleads with them as brethren. He's not really using his apostolic authority kind of at this point. He comes to them as, as a fellow believer and, and he begins to call them to unity. There's division in the church at Corinth. And that's the first thing he's going to deal with. Now, as we go through, some of you are familiar with the letter. And as we go through it, we'll all become familiar with the letter. But here's a church where Christians are taking one another to court. There's sexual immorality uh, openly endorsed within the church. Um, there's problems as it relates to divorce. Uh, they're misusing the agape feasts and, and everybody's eating their meals in front of one another, not caring about one another. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are it's just chaotic what they're doing with it. They're all goofed up doctrinally on the resurrection. And of all these serious problems that they have at that church, the first thing he begins with and evidently considers to be the most serious, most dangerous to the health of the church was division in it. It's the first thing that he addresses. The danger of Christians dividing against one another within the body of Christ there in uh, Corinth. So he talks to them, speaks to them about that division, that there would be no more uh, division. The devil loves division in the body of Christ. He's a do diablos is one of his names. He's a, he's a slanderer. And he loves to slander and he loves to create division. You know why? Because... When the body of Christ begins to cannibalize itself, he's got a free ride. We're occupied. We're occupied with destroying one another, and he can go out and then destroy the whole world that's out there waiting to hear the message that has changed our lives. So he loves nothing more than to see division in the body of Christ. And so Paul addresses that. There's hardly anything more miserable in all of the world than to be in a church that's in, in, the, in the midst of division. That, that kind of thing. Just miserable. And so he addresses this. And he comes to them, notice, not in his own name or even in his own authority. He comes to them, verse 10, by a higher authority, by the name or the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying there? Remember in John chapter 17, when Jesus, the night before he was crucified, and he prays for the body of Christ, what does he pray over and over and over again in that prayer? Father, that they would be one, even as we are one, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, that they may be one just as we are one, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and love them as I have uh, as you have loved me and, and the heart of the Lord for his body. He knows we have spots. He knows we have wrinkles. He knows that we're not going to be perfect until we get to heaven. But he loves his body and he's very concerned for the unity of the body of Christ. And so Paul comes in and says, hey, I'm, I'm not going to speak to you in my own authority. Remember what Jesus had to say about the unity of the body of Christ. Now, here... Um, he identifies the, the cause of the division in verse 11, for he says, It has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. And so that's the division, verse 12, that, that's going on. But it's interesting in verse 11 how he became aware of, uh, uh, of the division. A gentleman by the name of Chloe and his family, evidently there in Corinth in a part of the church, writes a letter or sends a messenger to Paul at Ephesus and informs him, Paul, this work of the Holy Spirit that you spent 18 months birthing, um, this thing is in real danger. 
There's division here. There's sexual immorality here. They're suing one another. This thing is going to blow up in a thousand different directions. We're in real trouble here. Now, when Paul or Chloe takes this information about what's happening in Corinth and he brings it to Paul, it's not gossip. And the reason it's not gossip and not slander is Paul's a part of the solution. Paul's an apostle. It is his responsibility in the body of Christ to address these things for the health of these individual churches. And I have tremendous respect for Chloe that he would come out and not only inform Paul of the problems, but then say to Paul, you can use my name. You can use my name. Every once in a while, I get a letter in the mail anonymous about one of you. Usually about two of you. And they send me, do you know this? And how could you, do you have any concern for holiness over there? And, and ye, you know, I mean, it's, I, I know all about them, Jack. And I know how they're, I know how they're writing. They write like that. They write like Jonathan Winters would write a letter. And so they lay this whole thing out and the whole deal and everything, and then they don't sign it. Now, what in the world am I supposed to do with that? It's hearsay. I have no means of verifying the truth of it. I have, and if somebody's life was in danger or something like that, I would proceed forward with it and, and go to the person. I just shred them. I just shred them. Because unless a person is going to give us their identity then I don't have anything, I can't verify, I can't get people, that, the two sides of things in a room and find out what the facts are and how the Bible lines up with it. And it's very important for us as Christians that when things happen in the body of Christ or even in a local body where you look at something and you go, that's dangerous. I, I, I know something about this situation and that's, that's dangerous for um, certain people on this and um, my life would be a lot easier if I just kept my mouth shut and and didn't let anybody know on this thing um, but it, it's dangerous maybe to the kids or maybe to whatever and then and then the person comes forward and says I've, I've got to let a leader know this thing and and you can use my name and I and the person can do that and they know my life my, my name is mud in, in this particular circle. But the Bible says that agape love does what's best. Not what's easiest. It does what's best. So I always appreciate Chloe here coming in and saying, listen, for the sake of the church, I could just clam up just like everybody else, you know, and just watch the whole thing disintegrate and, and all. But I, I love the Lord, the things of the Lord, the work that you've put in here, this body enough to tell someone. And so he told them about the contentions that were going on there. Then that, this isn't, these weren't mild disagreements. The word is contention. They weren't arguing over how many angels can dance on the head of a pin or these kinds of, of things. They were just at one another's throat fighting over, over things. And notice what they were fighting over. They had developed into factions surrounding their uh, favorite teachers. And so some of them within the church, they were looking and they would say, you know, listen, I am of Paul. Paul's my favorite teacher. And, uh, and, and Paul uh, being the one that God used to birth the church. People would have had a relationship with him. Paul, the great uh, uh, doctrinal teacher. Paul, the great theologian. And so within a local body, or the, remember in the church at Corinth, it's not like Modesto. they got one church in Corinth. In Modesto, we've got 150,000 churches in town. And it's wonderful. But, I mean, you can go find the church that you like. But, but here, there were those that looked and they say, I like doctrine. I like to be persuaded from the Scriptures. I like to be reasoned with from the Scriptures. And Paul established this church and he has a place like nobody else ought to have. And so they went into Paul's camp. Paul didn't want them to, but they did. And then there were others that said, I'm of Apollos. And we read about Apollos in the book of Acts. And Apollos was this great, you know, firebrand. He was a tremendous theologian. 
But he was fervent in spirit. He was eloquent. He was everything that the people at Corinth liked. The, the people at Corinth were really into the Greek philosophers, Greek wisdom. And uh, they kind of had this deal where they were more into how something was said than into what was being said. And, and there's a lot of that today. And, and so they looked at things and they said, you know, I'm of Apollos. You know, Paul, he just goes into all that stuff and in five minutes I can't follow him. And I like my truth on fire, you know, and Apollos, he's the guy and, and, and all of that. And, and then some said, I'm of Cephas, of Peter. And so you have your apostolic succession people uh, there and evidently. Or, the, or, or Peter, you know, his, he's still identified with, with Jerusalem. Still identified with a very conservative element of, of Christianity and, and kind of that go slow group. You know, Paul's out there. Gentiles are getting saved. And, you know, here he is. He's the cutting edge minister, you know, and they're doing all kinds of things they feel free to do in the spirit. You know, you go to Peter's meeting and I mean, it, you got some real sense of the Old Testament and everything on that. And, and so people like Peter. On all of that. By the way, I think apostolic succession is nonsense. If you're a Christian, you are in the apostolic succession. They got saved before you did, and you got saved after them. So I, I just don't understand what people want to fight and argue about. But I've joined the fight, haven't I? Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> and, this, and then he said, there are others that say, I am of Christ. That sounds noble. It's probably, you know, that super spiritual kind of person. That look and says, you know, I don't follow any man, you know, and I don't align with any church. It's, you know, I am of Christ. And all four of those, those same groups of people exist today they, in, in all. What, what's the common denominator of, of all four of those things? There's the great folly of Corinth was the elevation of the messenger, the elevation of personality over the message, at least concerning three of them. Leaders in the body of Christ are to be respected, uh, and, and the Bible teaches that. But they are never, ever in a single human heart to ever be elevated above Christ. The single greatest identity that we can have in our life is not I am of, I am of. The single greatest identity we can have is Christian, to be identified with the Lord Jesus. And so, you know, there was this splintering. Now, you know, sometimes, uh, um, you know, you can look at this kind of thing and say, well, this is the beginning of, of denominationalism and non-denominationalism. I am a Baptist. I am a Pentecostal. I am church of this or the second church of that and all that kind of thing. And I, I think that that can be true, but I think in a way it, 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 doesn't, necess it doesn't necessarily have to be true that, that um, denominations or non-denominations are, are playing into this. I think it's true if sections of the body of Christ elevate their place in the body of Christ, for instance, that they're Baptist or they're Pentecostal or they're Presbyterian or they're Calvary Chapel or non-denominational, when they elevate that as an identity concerning them higher than their identity as a Christian. There's a need for diversity in uh, the kinds of churches that are available in the community. That's why God puts all these different kinds of churches Otherwise, see, what he do? He just in a city like Modesto, he just buy 150 acres in the middle of town and and uh, uh, pave all around it and put a big building in there and some ball fields and we'd all meet together. Uh, but everyone wouldn't be sa happy there because we're different. So you have certain kinds of people where they they like a ministry like Paul's. They like the study of the word. They like the message of grace. They won't use it as an occasion to sin. They like the doctrine. They like that kind of thing. And then there's others that, man, you put them under a Paul, they'll, they'll die. They've got to be under an Apollos. Because if, if anyone carries a thought progression, you know, for, for too long and all, without a little fire and a handkerchief or something like that, you know, they'll, they'll kind of doze off on, on things. And, and we all, so we all have these different kind of personalities and how we relate to God and all these things. There needs to be the teaching of the word no matter what, what the, the, the study is uh, or the church is. 
And then, then there are those churches that are, they're highly liturgical and they, they, they light those candles and they got the incense going and you go in and, and uh, you could hear a pin drop, you know, and, uh, in there and you find a little quiet place and all. And there are people that legitimately, that is an environment where they meet with God like no other environment. And all of that's fine. Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, liturgical churches, Calvary chapels, whatever it might be. As long as we just look and say, you know, this is where I'm growing and and this is where I can relate to the Lord best. And I don't elevate that above the fact that they are Christians and I am a Christian. And that is the supreme title over all. But here we've got some kind of an elevation of things where these are becoming the identities over even, uh, you know, being a Christian. And Paul uh, asks them a, a series of questions here, rhetorical questions, in order to rebuke them and get their eyes back on what is important. He said, is Christ divided? And of course, Christ isn't divided, nor is his body was Paul crucified for you? And I mean, he kind of, he, he doesn't use Apollos or Cephas there. He, he uses himself as the illustration because that's the safest way to do it so they don't misunderstand. He says, was Paul crucified for you? People would listen and go, that's stupid. What do you mean, was Paul crucified? He said, then why do you elevate me to the place that only Christ should have? Why do you even put my name in that place? Why do you even, you know, give me that place in your mind? Give me that place in your heart. Much less. And the same thing goes with the other guys. Were we crucified for you? And if we were crucified for you, what good would it have done? And he's trying to get them, you know, come on, think about this. What's most important? The teachers are the one that we teach about. I like the strength of it. He said, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, and the Apostle Paul. No. No. Because why? You wouldn't do it because Paul's just a man. A great man, a great apostle. But he's just a man. And the gulf between man and deity is infinite. So he's, they, they've elevated these personalities way beyond where they ought to be. And so he, he rebukes them on it. He said, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Now, Crispus was another ruler of the synagogue there in uh, at Corinth and was one of the first converts of Paul in Corinth. And Paul baptized him and he baptized uh, Uh, Gaius, he said, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. So he's running through his mind thinking, okay, who did I baptize over there? And he he says, okay, I baptized the household of Stephanas. I baptized Crispus and I baptized Gaius. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any others. Now that shocks me. That the Apostle Paul, he, he didn't do a lot of baptizing. And what evidently he did is, is what the Lord Jesus did, and that is he allowed the disciples to baptize. Once the church had gotten established and all, and leadership was in place and all, he had done probably some of the early baptizing, but then pretty soon after, he allowed others to do the baptizing, and he gave himself to the preaching of the gospel. Verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Now, have, there's teach, the teaching today known as baptismal regeneration, that uh, the, uh, a person is not saved until they've been water baptized. And, and I can completely disagree with that. I, I understand the importance of water baptism. That was a commandment of Jesus. But to say that a person isn't saved unless they're water baptized, you, you're, you're saying that, that that is a work then that's added to the work of Christ. Or you're, you're going a place that I'm certainly not comfortable in, in going to. But if baptismal regeneration, that salvation or, or water baptism was necessary to be saved, then this passage makes no sense at all. Because it, Paul comes in and says, listen, Christ didn't send me to baptize. Well, if baptism is necessary for salvation, then what? it, it, it doesn't add up. Paul knew nothing of baptismal regeneration. 
He said, he didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And that is the theme that he goes into in the next section. And I have run out of time because it's going to take me a while to develop what comes next. I thought we'd get through chapter two tonight. <clears throat> this is a problem. This is a problem I have um, on things, but I um, I'll leave it there at 43 minutes and 54 seconds because the next thing is astonishing and it's all so tight that you can't begin it without finishing it.